Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jesse the Plants. We love bringing you new videos every week. And I know you enjoy watching them. So like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell so you will know when new content is posted. Like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Now sit back and watch this. Have y'all been enjoying this uh, Gospel of John series? You know, I, I don't think we have to be in a rush of how far, how long we're going to be in it because it's a pretty good book. Amen. It's so good. I mean, and there's so much that we could go in so many different directions. Tonight's message is part 11, the Gospel of John, part 11, and it is Jesus, the water of life. This whole chapter really focuses in on Jesus as the water of life. And we're going to turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Give our, our, our greeter, our usher team a little time to get settled in and get back. Praise the Lord. You know, when you'll come back, not, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, when you come back, this place will be all decorated for Christmas. Are you all excited about that? We're going to have some, we have some new trees I've just bought because the other ones bit the dust last year. You know, they were beautiful for a while, but they don't last forever. Got to replenish stuff, right? So they were white trees. This year we're having green trees with red bows and so excited about that. And it's going to be gorgeous because we just love celebrating Jesus. It's like the most beautiful time of the year. Oh, and don't forget Jesse's new book, The Hidden Help. I mentioned it on Sunday. It's back there in the cafe, and it's such a powerful book, and uh, you, you really want to get That would be a great Christmas gift for people if you're looking to give someone the word. It's full of interesting stories like only Jesse can tell, as well as there's also that other Christmas book out there that's still probably there, the most wonderful time of the year, a nice hardcover book that makes a good gift that came out a few years ago. Such a blessing. Amen? <coughs> Well, uh, again, I'm just going to start again for the sake of the tape because they do, they're airing this like on um, every Saturday. Anybody get a chance to listen to it or share it or something? Because we have it on our social, of course, Margie back there. <laughs> some of you may have missed a few, so you can go back and catch up on some of it because we're putting it on our social media posts uh, on Saturdays. At some point in, on a Saturday, it comes out there. You can keep an eye out for that or Put your notifications. Any people, everybody following us on social media? You can see because we're putting a whole lot of content out there. All of it is designed to help you and bless you and strengthen you. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to be talking about the Gospel of John, part 11, Jesus, the water of life. You know, I looked this up. Water makes up 60 to 75% of the human body weight. And a loss of just 4% of total body water leads to dehydration. A loss of 15% can be fatal. Of course, the nurse knows this. The nurses know this. But I found this out this afternoon when I was Googling it. A person could survive a month without food, but could, wouldn't survive three days without water. So this whole analogy about Jesus being the water of life is so perfect for us to understand how much we, we need him. He's a necessity. He's a life giver. Amen. So we're going to begin reading in uh, John chapter 7, starting at verse 1, of course. And I'll be reading in the King James Bible. We're going to see how Jesus, the water of life, how he impacted the people of that day. This whole story is so beautiful. And, and the way John describes it, it's really pointing to another sign that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And this was his whole focus in, uh, in the whole gospel that he wrote. John chapter 1, 7, beginning in verse 1, going through verse 8. It says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewelry, because the Jews sought to kill him. That's serious right there. <laughs> so this is why he, was start he had already started to make people mad and angry. You know, they said it was because of envy that they hated him. They hated it because he had the crowds. They were so boring. Nobody wanted to hear them guys, you know. But Jesus came on the scene. He was real. He says he doesn't talk like the scribes. He's full of life. He was so refreshing. That's what water is, right? It's refreshing. We're going to hear about that today. 
Verse 2, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples may also see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou doest these things, show thyself to the world. Now they were being sarcastic. They weren't trying to encourage him to go. They were, they were jealous. They were giving him a hard time, and he knew it. And uh, verse 5 says, Neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. You see, just showing up sometimes, your anointed life, your, uh, your spirit-filled life will shine a light on people. You might not realize why they're reacting that way. It says the devil in them is, is reacting to the spirit of God within you. So uh, we experience this as believers, but this was new to these people that day. Verse 8 says, Go ye up, this is brothers, Jesus is telling the brothers, Go ye up unto the feast, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. You know, it's so beautiful when you realize that Jesus only did what his father told him to do. He only said what his father told him to say. Moment by moment, he was led by God and where to go. Even when his friends came and told him, come to see Lazarus, he is sick, almost ready to die. And he waited several days because he was listening to the Spirit. He was listening to his father. He was led uh, by the Spirit while he was here. And so we, we could learn by that example. You know, so often we just want to jump when people uh, ask something instead of, or, or ask for prayer instead of waiting and pausing and thinking about letting the Spirit show us exactly what words need to be prayed for, amen, and how. So uh, this whole leading of the Spirit is, is, is a beautiful example of how everything he did. He didn't go up, just he let the brothers go. Verse 9, he says, And when he said the, these words to them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brothers were gone up, then he went also up into, unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jew, oh, did I go farther than I should have? I wanted to go to just verse 8. That's okay. So Jesus' brothers had a difficult time believing in him. And some of these brothers would eventually become leaders in the church, but for several years they seemed to be embarrassed by him and they were uh, offended. But Jesus, because of Jesus' virgin birth, they were only the half-brothers of Jesus since Mary, not Joseph, was Jesus' only human parent. People need to know that. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, you don't need to go there, lists Jesus' brothers as James, Joseph, Simon and Judas. Of course, you're not going to hear this in the Catholic Church. I'm just going to tell you because it says, Blessed Mary, ever virgin. No, she had some children. Yeah. The Bible tells us here. I can say that because I grew up Catholic. I, was, I did all the holy things. I did the holy communion, holy matrimony. I did the whole, whole ball of wax. And I love the Catholic people. But I love the truth more. Yes. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and, and then it goes on because... These brothers were there. At, well, James actually authored one of the New Testament's, uh, the uh, books of the New Testament that bears his name. And he became a leader of the Jerusalem church. Actually, he was a pastor of the Jerusalem church. And then Judas, or also called Jude, wrote the epistle that also bears his name. So even though they didn't believe in the beginning, they came around after he was resurrected. And God really used them. As part of, but I just think it's beautiful when they were, even when they wrote, they didn't refer to themselves as the brother of Jesus. They said the servant of Jesus when they wrote. So beautiful that they recognized his deity and because they saw the wonderful uh, signs and wonders and testified of it. So we're going to, uh, we just read all the way through through 9 and 10. But, you know, just to show you that they came and he went there in secret Jesus came with the greatest gift ever offered. So why did he often act secretly at this point? Well, like we just read in the previous part of the chapter, the, reli the religious leaders hated him. And the more Jesus taught and worked publicly, the more these leaders would cause trouble for him and his followers. The more the people loved Jesus, the more the leaders 
hated him, wanted to get rid of him, right? So it was necessary for Jesus to teach and work as quietly as possible sometimes because he had a mission to fulfill. If he would have stepped out and did things in uh, the way the crowd expected him to do it, then they, he could have, you know, they may have grabbed him and killed him ahead of time, but that was a certain timing that God was uh, working on, right? So he was, we have to, we can learn from that as well. Let's look at verse 11 again. We're going to read through verse 13. It says, then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Verse 12, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, he is a good man. Others say, nay, but he deceives the people. Howbeit, no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. So everybody was talking about Jesus all throughout that, that uh, festival time. Now, y'all remember I told you that when we talked about uh, the man that Jesus healed by the pool, that was on the Sabbath day, and how it was during a normal time, there would always be like 300 people there uh, on any given day. But when a festival time would come around, you could expect that to just quad, I mean, just go up to about 3,000 people, one commentary said, one theologian had said. So it could have been a huge crowd of people there that day when talking and murmuring. When it come to, came time to speak up in public, though, they were quiet, they were scared. Because the Jewish religious leaders had a great deal of power over the common people. They, uh, apparently, they couldn't do much to Jesus at this very time, but they were threatening anybody who might publicly support him. Okay. And so uh, one of the reprisals for believing in Jesus was excommunication from the synagogue, and we'll see that in John chapter 9 when we get there. But to a Jew, this was very, a very severe thing to be ostracized. So they were careful about what they said. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10 and see what Jesus said about that. And save your place because we're, gonna, we're not through in chapter 7, of course. Matthew chapter 10. Because fear can stifle our witness. You know, the Spirit of God moves upon us to share our faith with someone, and, and the enemy always wants to come in and put fear in there to stop us because he knows how effective your story can be. We don't have to quote chapter and verse, but our story is unique to us, and anytime you share the reality of what happened to you, it can impact another life. You know, people love stories. Why else do you think they follow all these social media things? They read, I mean, you read the craziest things. But we have some great news that we can tell people, right? Amen. And your story can take on so many different characteristics. We were doing a, a glorious living program today. I was doing it with, with Chrissy, and, and it was actually our anniversary program. I don't know, has anybody ever seen the glorious living program that we post once a week? Well, we, we brought up, we look back over the year and just kind of thinking about it, reminiscing about a few of the stories that were told during this time. And, and we brought up Tyler. I saw Tyler sitting there, so I was just thinking about remembering his story about his passion and his vision. And, and also Jessica's story was so beautiful. We, had a, we talked about that and just a handful that we remembered, but we had 52 different ones that we've done. So now we're kicking into 53 that's going to air. Uh, this one's going to air the Friday after that we did today. It's going to air at the Friday after Thanksgiving. So just thinking about all the stories, we read a story that someone writes in, but we also try to bring a person on and share their story because stories are important. And when you share what, what God does for you, fear can go out the window. You don't have to worry about whether they're going to receive it or not. You just tell it. Amen? Amen. And, and, and it can have a, a, a great effect. So don't let fear stifle your witness. You know, and although many people talk about Christ in church when it comes to making a public statement about their faith, they sometimes can be embarrassed. But that's the enemy attacking you to try to shut you up. But we, need, we have to realize that we have to stand up for Jesus. Amen. Let's read this in Matthew chapter 10. Start reading in verse 16. I'm sure you're familiar with this verse. It says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's good advice. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them 
and the Gentiles. You see, Jesus, Jesus is telling this to his disciples ahead of time, and they all, many of them, if you read the book of Acts, they experienced a lot of this. Verse, but they knew about it ahead of time. And, and just a little side notes, I, I remember that, y'all remember that Jesus told Peter that Satan desired to sift you, but I have already prayed for you. So no matter what attacks come, just know that we have our intercessor that's already at work, already praying for us, amen? amen. Verse 19, but when they deliver you up, take, I love this one, take no thought how or what you shall speak for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Think about that. This reminds me of when Jesus was with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, and he's saying to them, Who do men say that I am? And uh, they start telling them who they are, uh, that people are telling him who they think Jesus is. And then he turns it to them. He says, but who do you say that I am? Well, Peter speaks up and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, Peter didn't know at that point that that was the father talking to him, that father had revealed that to him. But Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my father, which is in heaven. See, that confirms this verse. We are spirit beings first and foremost. And we have a body and, you know, we, we live in a body, but we have a soul. And so our spirit is connected to God. And so we have to realize that our spirit can be a container for the Holy Spirit. When our spirit is filled up with the Holy Spirit, no matter where we go, we may not hear an audible voice, but you got a knowing in your heart, I have to go here, I have to do that. God is, you know when you're being led by the Spirit, don't you? Can I see a show of hands? I'm not the only one. <laughs> but it's so powerful when you realize that that's available for us. Uh, verse 21, and the, brother, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to, put to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call him, them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Amen. Such wise words. Verse 27, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But verily, the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also, I, him also, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So this whole passage was important to read because he starts out about being wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, but he talks about, and it ends up in verse 33 and 34, about how we cannot deny him. We have to be true to him, amen? amen. And so we have to be, uh, realize that no matter what uh, attacks may come, we have to stand for Jesus, Hallelujah. right? Amen. Jesus said that if we will acknowledge, uh, he will acknowledge us before God if we acknowledge him before others. That's why it's so important to tell your testimony. And you know what? When you first start doing it, it's like, it's like spiritual vitamins. It will strengthen you. I'm telling you, it surely will. Because the world hated Jesus, we who follow him can expect that the people will hate us as well. 
But we have to love them more than they hate us. We have to realize that we have, we have to walk in the love of God and not push back what they throw at us. We have to be bigger than that, amen? Yeah, amen. And, and recognize that that's what we're called to do. He, you, that doesn't mean you can't tell the truth and say it, but you say it the truth, speak the truth in love, the word tells us. If circumstances are going too well, you must ask yourself if you're following Christ as you should. <laughs> We can be grateful when life goes well, but we must also make sure that it's not at the cost of following Jesus half-heartedly or not at all. There's a lot of what we call seeker-friendly places, people that are just halfway in or they think they're halfway in. They, they're really deceived because either you're all the way in or you're all the way out. There's no in-between. Amen. Amen. Amen? So we need to be courageous. We need to speak up for Christ. Let's go back to John chapter 7, start reading again at verse 14, and continue studying about Jesus, the water of life. The Pharisees, oh, let me, wait, verse 14, okay, verse 14, this is this heading on my Bible, says the Jews marvel at Jesus' teaching. Okay, verse 14, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but this, but his that sent me, speaking of his father. Verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory hath that sent him. But he that, let me say that again, verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law? Why do you go about to kill me? The people answered, he said, thou hast the devil. Wait, verse 20. The people answered and said, Thou hast the devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? Verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken... Are you angry with, at me because I've made a man every whit whole, even on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. He was bringing to their remember, he was telling them about the time where a lot of this hostile uh, attitude started when he healed that man at the pool. And because he did it on the Sabbath day, and they were fussing about him because he had told the man to pick up his mat and walk. And that was done on the Sabbath day, and he made this man well. And, and, and that was condemned, but they allow the circumcision to fall even if it's on a Sabbath because it was the law of Moses, showing them how ridiculous they were being. And they were so blinded to, to what was going on. So he's trying to open their eyes to it. You see, the Pharisees spent their days trying to achieve holiness by keeping meticulous rules that they had added to God's laws. Jesus' accusation that they didn't keep Moses' laws stung them deeply. It cut to the quick, as they say. And they were living far below the law of Moses that was required. And actually, thinking about mur killing Jesus was murder, which was certainly against the law. But most of the people that were around that day that were hearing a lot of this probably was not aware of the plot to kill Jesus. We read about some of that in John chapter 5. But there was a small group looking for that right opportunity to kill him. And the majority of the people were still trying to decide what they believed about this guy. They were still just finding out about him. But Jesus pointed out that these religious leaders allowed certain exceptions to the Sabbath laws. But they allowed none of those exceptions to Jesus who was showing mercy upon people who needed healing. It just shows us that we can't get into that religious trap. We need to be spirit-led, and, and even when we're reading the scriptures, we can't use it as a weapon against people. We have to use the scriptures with love, and we have to trust that God will lead us and guide us in what to say. Amen? Amen. I, I think our lives should be 
be an example, but also we should be ready to give the word at some point. Amen. I remember I've told this story a few times, but I just thought about it again when I always just wanted to give a testimony in church. I just said, Lord, I just want to give a testimony. You know, I was in a little church, so that's what they did. And that was very common in some of the uh, full gospel churches that we, we, Jesse and I, were in in the beginning of our spiritual life. After I got born again, you know, we, uh, I, we just, I, I found a church every time I could. You know, if I weren't, we weren't traveling, I would find a little church. So I was in a whole lot of different churches. And not all of them did that, but I, that happened at this little church I went to. They'd say, anybody have a testimony tonight? And so people would stand up. Not all of them had a good testimony. A lot of them, they started out with telling you what the devil was doing to them or the problems they had. And finally, after 10 minutes, they go like one little statement, but the Lord is good. Okay, shut up and sit down. I don't, wanna, I don't care to hear that. But I remember really wanting to tell a testimony, and I would get up every time, but I could only could just get out. I want to thank the Lord, and it wasn't that clear. I would just say, I want to thank, and I'd just start crying. And tearing up, it was just so precious to me. And I really had a goal that I wanted to be able to say something. And, and um, finally the day came, you know, and I, the whole church erupted in applause, you know, because I don't know if they liked what I said or they're just glad that I finally got it all out. But, <laughs> but we all have that within us. I think once we encounter God, we just want to bring others to him and help them to find what is so precious. You know, like, it's like that pearl of a great price the scriptures talk to us about, you know, and that like if you lose something, you go looking for it. Anybody ever lost something in your house? You're still looking for it? I'm not giving up till I find it. Maybe it's an ink pen or your glasses or your keys. <laughs> Can't go anywhere without the keys. But anyway, we, we keep searching and we keep, but when we find it, we're happy about it. And so you know that when people really find the truth, they'll be happy about it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, let's continue reading verse 25 through 36 this time. <clears throat> then said some of, the, some of the, them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? So some knew he was, he was on a list. He was on a hit list, as they say, in the neighborhood. Anyway... But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? How be it, we know this man which he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me and know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not, hour was not yet come. Verse 31. And many of the people believed on him, and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than this which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while I am with you, then I go unto him who that sent me. Ye seek me, and shall not find me, and, and where I am thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither Will he go? These little old English words are getting me. Excuse me. Y'all y'all following me though, right? I just want to stick to the King James. And sometimes these withers and thithers and all those others. We're following it though, right? Y'all got it. He will go into this, this. They said, will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles to teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither you cannot come. Why? They're wondering, why is he saying all these things? You see, in this chapter, the people had many different reactions toward Jesus. Some people called him a good man. Some called him a fraud. Some called him demon-possessed. Some called him the Messiah. Some said, this is the prophet whose coming had been predicted by Jesus. There was a, a mixture in the crowd. You know, you... There, you, some of them knew the truth, recognized it, and embraced it. So these phrases that he's telling them were veiled. But the ones who were hungry for him, they understood it clearly. So he knew his audience, and he was saying what he needed to say. 
And it was so beautiful to see that happen because there was a popular tradition that the Messiah would simply appear, although that's not scriptural. Those who believed in this tradition were ignoring the scriptures that predicted Messiah's birthplace, you know, that he would be born uh, in Bethlehem. The angel, the uh, wise men knew were following a star and they went to the, the priests and asking them, where is, where is he supposed to be born? And they looked in the scriptures and they found that it would be in Bethlehem. So they went there. But it was revealed in the scriptures if you would look. Amen. Amen. So before we move on farther to the, rest, to the rest of this chapter, I just want to talk a little bit about what's about to happen because we're about to hear Jesus make a big announcement and there's a crowd of people around this spot because this was the day, the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, which we read about in the beginning of the chapter. It's sometimes also called the Festival of Shelters or Booths and it's described in Leviticus 23, but we're not gonna go there. Just, just to know that it was a tradition. It was one of the three festivals that was required uh, celebrations that had to be attended to. And this one occurred in October, about six months after the Passover celebration. And it commemorated the days when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and lived in shelters, which is what they even do today. I don't know, even if you go to some neighborhoods that are predominantly Jewish, even in cities in the U.S., you'll see these little booths or these little uh, little shelters that they've erected like even on their patios, you know, because they're in observance of it. And if you Google it, you'll see how it's even done in Israel today. But that commemorated how they lived in these temporary tabernacles, these little booths or shelters in that wilderness time when that they were, God was taking care of them. So it also signified God's presence was with them. And it pointed toward a day when God will tabernacle with men and Jesus was there on the scene to, to let them know how important this was. Amen. So it was a special celebration and it involved the whole family. And like Passover, this festival taught family members of all ages about God's nature and what he had done for them. And it was a time of renewed commitment to God. And it was a very joyful festival. And if you, uh, some of the commentaries that I read about, they talked about how they had lights that were displayed everywhere. I haven't been there during that time but I've heard about it and how it's just the whole place is so well lit. And br br I've been to Israel, but not during that season and that time. But um, some of you may be more familiar with all of that than me. But just help me as I, as I struggle along with this. But it's so beautiful. I've, I've learned so much about it. I've heard that, you know, this was like a seven, a eight day festival. It started on a Sabbath and it ended always on a Sabbath. So it was full eight days and every day, there was so many th activities and things that were going on. But I learned about something else that's really not even in the scriptures, but it's a tradition that started, uh, and it was in, a, in effect at the time of Jesus. And it's called the water pouring ceremony. And, um, but you, you, may not, you may not be able to find it in scripture. It says it, I, I found this online description, and it says, what ceremony? It says this was the first time, if this is the first time you're hearing about it, it may sound, uh, it may be because it's not mentioned in the Bible. Why do we mention it then, it's saying? Uh, because the ritual must have started sometime during the Old Testament days, and it was mentioned only in the Talmud, the oral law honored by the Jewish people. Nevertheless, the tradition was widely practiced in Jesus' time. So the water pouring ceremony, it says, or the water drawing as an event on the last day of Sukkot, which is the, tab the, uh, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's another word for it. The priests would pour water over the altar that was earlier drawn from the pool of Siloam, that one that we talked about where they were hanging around the pool. They would go down and they would draw this water. I read that they did this every day. They would walk down into a steep incline to get it and come back up, and they would pour it actually on the altar. They would do it one, uh, and the people would say certain things. Let me see. Let's turn to Hebrews, excuse me, to um, Isaiah chapter 12. I want you to see that for yourself. Isaiah chapter 12. I'm still there. So this water pouring ceremony or water drawing was an event on the last day of Sukkot. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Sukkot. 
The priests would pour water over the altar that was earlier drawn from the pool of Siloam. The previously mentioned name, there's also other names for it, uh, called Soshana Raba, which means great salvation, was derived from the words of the prophet Isaiah. He wrote in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Thus the people were drawing and pouring water while praying for salvation. I heard, uh, I heard it told that what would actually happen, they would bring to pour the water and the whole crowd would sing this. They would declare this, this verse, therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Well, on this last day, which we're, we're going to go back to John chapter 7, on this last great day, this verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Picture this, where they're normally on every day they would come in, they would walk up and they'd pour that water on that altar. Uh, one uh, commentary I read, they said that they would, on the last day of the feast, it was a little different. That they would come in and they would walk, walk, march around the altar seven times before they poured the water on the altar, which signified that marching seven times around Jericho. That was what, when it ended the whole wilderness experience and they walked into that promised land. And so here it was when they had poured, done that, everything was quiet, not a sound in that space, when they were walking around that seven times and then when they were pouring the water, the, the whole crowd knew this was the moment they were all supposed to say, that scripture that we read in Isaiah chapter um, 12, verse 3, that said, With joy, therefore with joy shall you draw water out of all the wells of salvation. So you know it was quiet, waiting for the moment whenever I was supposed to speak. And this is when Jesus speaks up and says, If any man thirst, and he didn't whisper it. And he had to have said it loud and strong for thousands to have heard him. And God melt, amplified his voice. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. So here it is, salvation's right there in their midst, and he's proclaiming his divinity there. Can you imagine the impact of that that day? And he says, he, be he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow living water. So here it is, the living water comes in the scene. And this, all of this reenactment was to point, a, point the way for when he would come. And here he was that day in the middle of them. How beautiful was that? Yes. Glory to God. So the apostle John calls it the greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's no coincidence that on this day, Yeshua, Jesus, was on the Temple Mount to tell his brothers and sisters that they can give, he can give them living water. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout for that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is a Hebrew saying I heard about. It says, he who has not seen the rejoicing at the place of the water drawing has never seen rejoicing in his life. So it has to be a crazy praise kind of place. It has to be an eruption. And you know what? That's how we need to be praising God. Because when we show up at this place and gather together as believers, we are, we are testifying that the water of life lives within us. And we're honoring him. Amen? Amen. And we've already tasted it. And we know we need that water every single day. We need it throughout the day. I, I, don't know, I, I need more than one sip in a day. My husband's always laughing at me because no matter what the dot, whatever the problem is, I'm all, my answer is always, you need to drink more water. <laughs> He's laughed at me so much about that, but I can't tell you how often I've been proved right. Water is very important to our physical bodies, but God uses this as an illustration to show us that our spiritual bodies need it as much or even more. You know, I, I, like I said, I, can tell, I carry a bottle of water many times and and I'll drink a lot of water. The first thing when I go to the restaurant, usually they'll ask me what I want to drink. I'll say, I'll take water, no ice, no lemon, please. So that makes sure I get a lot of water right away. And then I'll get something else maybe later. But I've just gotten used to that. And it's a good habit. But water is good for us. God knows what we need. 
physically, but he also knows what we need spiritually. This is why he came to that feast. He let his brothers go on ahead because had, God had a plan. And this was an or, uh, orchestrated, st- specific, uh, strategic plan of heaven because it was in the court of heaven had this uh, ordained for this moment for this to happen. It had to happen. This was fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah. And, and in fact, also look at Isaiah 55 because there are many Bible um, passages that talk about the Messiah's life-giving, refreshing blessings. Just one more in Isaiah we'll read. We could read more, but for Isaiah 55, verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat, and come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. So it's talking about getting a refreshment. It's talking about a spiritual renewal, a strengthening for your body. Go to the last page of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. We'll see this again. It's so beautiful. Shouldn't take you long to go there. If you just go to the very back, I know you might have some concordances. But it's so good to see. This is um, verse 17. Twenty, chapter 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Amen. This just shows us how Jesus, the water of life, is so essential to our spiritual life as well as our physical life. Amen? Amen. God has has planned this out for us to understand this tonight, how we really need him every single moment of every day. Hallelujah. I just feel him just filling us up, refreshing us, putting this truth in our heart in such a strong way. Amen. Amen. Jesus used the term living water also in John chapter 4, which we read about in a previous study, to indicate eternal life. He talked about this gift of living water to that woman at the well. We've already studied on that. That's a beautiful story. And in verse 38 of this chapter, of of the chapter 7, he uses this term to refer to the Holy Spirit, and the two go together. Wherever the Holy Spirit is accepted, he brings eternal life. And Jesus teaches more about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 through 16, and we'll study about that again in a future study. So we're not going to get into all of that. Just giving you an overview. But the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus' followers at Pentecost as well. So this living water that that, uh, belongs to us is such a refreshing thing. It is so powerful. And when Jesus promised to give the Holy Spirit to all who believe, Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, for that was something that only the Messiah could do. And so he was revealing himself to his people that day. And I'm so glad that John wrote it down for us to read. Let's continue reading in John chapter 7. Uh, Look at verse 40. We're going to go down to 49 for a moment. I'm going to have to speed it up, Catherine. (laughs) Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Verse 45, then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, "Never never man spake like this man. Never man spake like this man. Verse 47, then answered them the Pharisees, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. So these people were so deceived and they were trying to attack anyone else who believed in Jesus. Because the leaders had developed hundreds of trivial laws, It was almost impossible for anyone, even the leaders themselves, to not break, neglect, or ignore at least a few of them some of the time. But these temple guards couldn't find one reason to arrest Jesus, even though they had tons of little things. They said never, he says, never a man spoke like this man. 
We all have to come to a point where we realize nobody else can do me like Jesus. You know that old song? Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Can't nobody do me like... Only Jesus can give me the words of eternal life. Only Jesus can refresh my soul better than anything else, better than any other thing, better than any vacation, better, better than any uh, meal, Amen. better than any, even a day off in the sunshine. Right. I mean, those things are great, and I'm glad to get them. But Jesus is the most important thing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's continue reading so we can close. We don't want to stay too late. I know it's good. I'm enjoying it. I hope somebody else is. Verse 50, we're going to finish out the chapter. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and, I, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for, thou art, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went to his own house. So they tried to shut him up and cancel him. But Nicodemus spoke up. And I appreciate that. You know, you need to speak up even if they don't look like they receive it. You've got to still, you're still responsible to say what you need to say. You see, Nicodemus was the Pharisee who visited Jesus at night. We studied that in John chapter 3. So apparently Nicodemus had become a secret believer. Nicodemus is right there. This, he's the one who confronted the Pharisees about the failure to keep their own laws. And uh, since most of the Pharisees hated Jesus and wanted to kill him, Nicodemus was really risking his life, risking his reputation and his high position, even though he only spoke up kind of indirectly about Jesus. Remember I told you when we talked about Nicodemus, he was like the third richest man in all of Jerusalem. So he had a heavy-weighted voice, but they still shut him down. But he said what needed to be said. And after the death of Jesus, Nicodemus brought spices for uh, Jesus' body. You'll read that in John chapter 19 later. But that was the la that'll be the last time that he's mentioned in the scriptures. You see, the Pharisees were losing ground. The temple guards came back impressed by Jesus. We read that in verse 46. And then one of the Pharisees' own, Nicodemus, was defending him. So they recognized that there, that was things, there was a shift. So, but with their, their hypocritical motives were being exposed, and their prestige was slowly being eroded away, so they began to move to protect themselves. Their pride would not let them interfere with reason, their ability to reason. They were just blocked off. You know, there's some people that just make a decision to close their mind. And, you know, we can pray for them, but we can't change. We could, like they say, you can lead a horse to water. <laughs> you can't make them drink. We still have a responsibility to tell people about the Lord. And what they do is their business. You know, you do what God tells you to do. And because the word tells us there are some that, that plant the seed, there's some that water, but God's the one that brings the increase. So we don't have to watch, you know, just so we do our part. Somebody else may come around and do another part. And then God will bring the increase. We just, when everybody's obedient, doing what they're supposed to do, all of God's will will be done. Amen? Amen. So this is what we're studying about tonight, about how Jesus is the water of life. And I don't know about you, but this thought of his refreshing water here, even here tonight, is just transforming me. I don't know about you guys, but it's just bringing me to another level of understanding how, how essential he is to my everyday life. Not just getting to heaven, which I'm looking forward to like everybody else. You know, I'm not, I'm not just looking for fire insurance. I want to live for him every single day. You know, it's just knowing him is everything. And when I see you on fire for God and hungry for the word of God, it just charges me up as well. Because we, we're a team here. We're, we're all working on the same team, reaching people, changing lives, going where God's calling us all to go and impacting lives. And, and it's so important that we, we put the Word of God first. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. I hope you learned something. Yeah. 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 Amen. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.